Okay, we are uh, going to start. Uh, I, Lisa, since already Debbie uh, greeted you. We are, I am Lia Certino. I am the director of founder of C Junction, and C Junction is a public venue based in Bangkok for focusing on Southeast Asia. And these days, a lot is about Myanmar in view of uh, the terrible things that are happening they, there. As we wish uh, each other peace and um, for the new year and all a very good intention for the new year, we are still very far from realizing a peace in the world. And for sure, we are extremely far from realizing peace in Myanmar. This is the 17 uh, updates we have done since the beginning of the coup. We have been uh, uh, grateful and honored to have very good resource person who give a very comprehensive view of uh, what is happening in Myanmar, as we believe that is extremely important to continue to be informed, even more important now that the international community is somehow interested again with a new variant of COVID and forget many other important things. So for this is the fifth episode with Debbie Stoddard and I think she is well known. She's an active promoter of human rights in Burma and to Asia and the Secretary General of ASEAN. As usual, uh, we are going to have her speak for about 20 minutes and then we will open the floor for question and answer. Welcome to everyone. Hello, hello everybody. And um, you know what uh, Leah didn't uh, notice that I wore a shirt, especially for her, but Indonesian batik shirt made from fabric bought in Minjan in the west of Burma when we were having a workshop there a few years ago. Uh, Minjan uh, in Sagai region is really well known for a very progressive voice, a leftist voice. And um, in uh, Burma's history, it was also the location of a um, socialist uh, uprising, a communist uprising against the authorities. So um, I went there to support the local cotton industry and inadvertently bought Indonesian batik as well. So. Um, um, I just wanted to share a PowerPoint and I have a special bonus for you, for all of you people who, who uh, are already on Christmas holidays. And um, I'm just actually, hang on, I've just lost, ah, yes, there, here we are. My, okay, here we are. Okay, cool. Um, uh, so what am I doing here? Um, see all sites, no? Nope. Uh, block or unblack slideshow. I'm just supposed to, oh yes, hide the presenter view. All right, here we go. Um, so I have a special bonus for you, for all of you people who who um, zoomed in during Chris, the week leading up to Christmas, um, um, and I'll share it with you later. So uh, remember in previous sessions, uh, I spoke about um, keeping a closer eye on human rights in Burma, conflict in Burma, um, Burma, Myanmar, as we head into the end of the new year. Let's not forget the conflict trends, as I, sh as I shared in previous sessions, shows that uh, the number of attacks targeting or affecting civilians in Burma, Myanmar, during the months of September, October and November were already escalating. And but what was shocking was the realization that these conflict numbers across the country in Burma, Myanmar were more than similar numbers in Syria and Afghanistan combined for the same months for September, November, uh, September, October, and November. So the military also. Uh, previously set a deadline of April to gain control of the country. Well, um, they obviously grossly misunder, uh, uh, they grossly underestimated the energy and uh, the determination of young people and ethnic people and women um, to to hang on to to, to 
get democracy, their commitment for democracy and human rights and their resistance, they underestimated the civilian re resistance and the nationwide resistance that would follow the, the military attempt to grab power. So now we've seen um, uh, the military move their deadline to the end of this year, and we already started to see in the past few weeks some very serious uh, developments. For example, the KNU earlier this month, the KNU uh, reported that 151 clashes had already taken place between Korean National Liberation Army troops and the illegal junta in November. Um, and, uh, um, and, and we already were expecting, okay, this is going to get worse. Um, in the first three days of December alone, in Karen State, there were 10 clashes between illegal junta troops and the KNLA Brigade 5. And then we started to see all hell break loose when uh, last week, the junta troops raided KNU control Lake Lei Keiko in Miyawari district near the Thai border, grabbing, abducting uh, at least 32 people, including NLD MP like Wailin Aung and striking civil servants. And, um, and now if, uh, well, the UN, the UN High Commission for Refugees said that on 16 to 17 December, over 2,500 people fled into Thailand. But um, more recent briefings show that um, there's at least 10,000 people already displaced. Uh, some have been trying to seek shelter in Thailand. And some of them have been rebuffed. Some of them were allowed to arrive, but then uh, forced to return. So um, we really need, we've been calling, I mean, I think the entire movement have been consistently calling for cross-border aid to start and for Thailand to open up its borders to allow international uh, international agencies, international organizations to work in partnership with ethnic, ethnic and locally based health and social organizations already operating in these areas for decades to, um, to, to help those, not just those facing severe humanitarian um, difficulties because of being bombed and possibly displaced, but also those um, also struck uh, local local health organizations struggling to uh, cope with the COVID pandemic. Um, you know, we need to understand that uh, the military junta is not just um, uh, attacking Karen state. The attacks that were taking place in the West, in Sagaing region and Chin state were also escalating in the past few weeks. Um, and we, we, we spoke about, the last time I was with you, we spoke about what happened in Salinji Township in Sagain. Um, we, 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 we looked at what was happening um, with local communities being um, bombarded with artillery fire and um, subjected to airstrikes. So uh, what we are seeing now um, is that the military junta is actually launching two very aggressive um, two very aggressive attacks on both the East in Karen state, um, not just targeting the Karen, but really uh, penalizing the Karen for sheltering uh, pro-democracy activists, including MPs elect and members of the national unity government. So we have to understand that um, uh, besides having to deal with uh, the humanitarian crisis as a result of escalated conflict, the Karen were further targeted because they were offering shelter to leaders of the democracy movement and then in the West. And so remember how we were talking uh, a couple of weeks ago about the fact that the junta had recalled uh, retired members of the military to come back to, to work, to come back to active duty, and they were forcing um, the family members of um, soldiers to do non-combat military duty so that um, soldiers could be freed up to do combat duty. So this meant not just wives having to do um, um, sentry duty, but also um, the military eating its own young. In, in addition to killing civilian children, the military junta, senior general Min Aung Lai and his, uh, 
co and his cohorts have actually been forcing the children of soldiers to be uh, to engage in military training. So they the military knows that they have to keep on killing people. They have to keep on launching these brutal offensives and commit con continue committing atrocity crimes and war crimes against civilians in their country. And they're running and they are running low on soldiers. So they're actually trying to free up. Um, soldiers and also train up the next generation of cannon fodder to go out there and commit more atrocities. So I think um, if, if this hasn't convinced anyone that uh, we are in a serious situation, that the security, the UN Security Council and the international community, including ASEAN and now including Australia, shame on you, Australia, I'm going to talk about this later, um, that that you need to take, take this um, as seriously as other countries have taken the Syria and Afghanistan situation. This is Burma. You, uh, you need to understand that this situation could blow up, is literally blowing up in our faces, in our front yard. So, so I think we, um, I'm trying to restrain myself here because I've been told to mind my language. So um, I'm, it's been difficult, that's why I'm stumbling. Um, but I think we, we do need to understand what, what, what is going on and, and understand that international reactions have not met the challenge, have not been proportionate to the seriousness of the situation. One piece of the good news is that a bipartisan amendment to the fiscal year um, of the National Defense Author Authorization Act uh, was made. It's kind of interesting. The US Congress has all these interesting um, um, ways and means of getting things done if they have the political will. You can either uh, propose a new piece of legislation and sometimes that takes a lot more time and effort or you can amend an existing piece of legisl legislation to add all kinds of interesting stuff. So um, the amendment requires senior officials from state treasury and the de defense departments of the US and USAID, very importantly, um, to uh, brief the Congress on specific US policy and security objectives in Burma, including um, looking at the impact of local existing sanctions, um, efforts to support NUG and other democratic actors, including um, the Ministry for Women, Youth and Children and the Ministry for Human Rights, um, while denying legitimacy to the junta and um, how the key objectives of restoration of democracy in Burma are being met. And just as importantly, and this is quite important, I, I think you need to understand that they're actually talking about accountability for atrocities and human rights in violations in Burma. Now, in, uh, including the treatment of and release of political prisoners, including a review of Russia and China's strategic interests and any actions taken by these countries. Now, when we talk about accountability, we have to understand this is the USA. And US has been severely allergic to, uh, to dis public international discussions around accountability in principle. Yeah, and this is because of uh, um, um, the calls for accountability for what they've done in Afghanistan and the Middle East. But, and also the US uh, uh, so hated the International Criminal Court that uh, under Trump, um, the, the Trump administration it actually imposed visa bans on Fatou Ben Souda, the, um, the then um, ICC um, prosecutor, and also um, prohibited US organizations from offering aid or support to the ICC. So you can see that, um, you know, the severity of the situation in Burma somehow has helped convince the powers that be on the Hill to actually talk about accountability. 
So there's still hope, there's hope. So, and this is also um, the, some of the ironies around what Burma has done, both to um, uh, key international stakeholders and to organizations like ASEAN. You know, um, when, when I started ASEAN back in 1996, um, when various ASEAN leaders were immensely allergic to, the, to, to the, the vocabulary of human rights and democracy. But as we pushed ASEAN on Burma, eventually they had to respond and they started talking about human rights and democracy as if it was desirable. And you know, we were dealing essentially with what was traditionally ASEAN, a traditionally a club of dictators and wannabe dictators. So you know, it was the Burma debate, the campaigning, the pressure around Burma and Burma entering ASEAN that actually got the ASEAN leaders to talk about human rights and democracy. Yes, talk, talk. Um, but still, um, and now we see um, um, uh, U.S. Uh, leadership actually talking about accountability for atrocities and human rights violations. So, um, as Bur you know, as Burma struggles and suffers, and people resist, um, they need to understand that what they're doing has some very far-reaching implications um, on how. Uh, some key stakeholders traditionally view human rights, democracy, and now accountability. Uh, also, uh, uh, on, on December 10th, um, Progressive Voice led uh, uh, the draft, led a letter, a joint statement, in which 255 civil society organizations, including ASEAN, um, and um, but mostly organizations from inside Burma uh, to call on the United Nations agencies, funds, programs, and other entities to cease all forms of cooperation that lend legitimacy to the illegal, murderous Myanmar military junta. This includes signing memorandums of understanding and inviting junta representatives to meetings as the junta continues to callously inflict, inflict immense suffering on the people of Burma and deepen an already catastrophic human rights and humanitarian crisis. So, um, you know, uh, it's so ironic that organizations that are supposed to do humanitarian work in the pursuit of their work may actually cause more harm then um, they may harm more than they help. And here is a case in point. So um, uh, in October, uh, 300 and more than 350 civil society organizations, mainly from Burma, but also allies from around the world already wrote to the international financial institutions like World Bank, IMF, Asian Development Bank to call for the repurposing of 820 million US dollars that had been allocated for COVID related economic recovery in Burma this year, for this year. And we are saying, since the money is frozen, can you repurpose it for cross border aid? Well, those guys um, sat on their hands. And in the meantime, we are facing now with these two challenges that moves and noises made by UN aid, so-called humanitarian agencies and other so-called humanitarian agencies to recognize the junta in, in, in return for some type of limited access to the country. At the same time, we're seeing um, basically what is a humanitarian catastrophe as a result of military aggression and war crimes being inflicted on the west of the, the western border of Burma and the eastern of border of Burma. So we do need to actually um, tell these guys, we told you so in advance, you bloody well sat on your hands and you kept quiet and gave us mealy, mealy mouth excuses when you responded. And now can you see what the hell is happening? Can you please 
get some get your act together and actually do what you're supposed to do instead of what you think you should do um and of course this morning i got a whatsapp from Monzin from friends in australia saying uh talking about this uh the australian defect the department of foreign affairs and trade the department of foreign affairs and trade actually um had a nice little meeting in canberra where they invited asean heads of missions to a meeting to talk about nice 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 things about cooperation and then they had a lovely little um uh photo uh photo op where everybody gathered around and stood around the australian and asean flags smiled etc etc but guess who they recognized as an asean head of mission none other than the ambassador standing for the illegal military junta so you know australia's a national anthem is called advance australia fair well a lot of us uh, who have been critical of australia's policies over the years keep referring to advance australia unfair now dfat the department of foreign affairs and trade on their website no less actually says um, Australia promotes human rights to constructive bilateral blah 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 and um, at the in at the cases of especially uh, in the in the gross case of gross human rights violations we will sanction sorry I can't actually read this because um, on zoom you can only see part of your slide but yeah so the um, the the they said they would sanction um, uh, 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 perpetrators, especially in the case of gross human rights violations. What the hell do you think has been happening since February? And is this how you sanction by rewarding um, the military representative with a with a photo op? Like, oh, jeez. Um, we're, we're also supposed to talk about the Hun Sen say extending the olive branch to military. Um, uh, regime, the illegal military regime, which the uh, Special Advisory Council on Myanmar have already clearly issued a legal opinion labeling this illegal junta as terrorists under international law. So go and look up that website. But um, what I'm going to do is I, I'm going to I've run out of time to rant and rave. Um, and I, well, during the Q&A, I'll actually share with you a tweet, um, a little tweet that we put up on uh, uh, from Altsian. But um, now that we are, now I'm coming to the end and I have to actually be nice about this. So I just wanted to say, um, it's a couple of days away from Christmas. And yeah, even if you're atheist, pagan, or from um, uh, another faith, if you're living in a Western dominated um, situation, this is the time of the year when everybody goes on holidays. It's also a tough time of year for people who are, uh, you know, who've gone through it. Uh, for many of us, it's a tough time as we wind down or trying to wind down for the end of the year, we're actually on hyper alert for yet more atrocities as the military junta escalates its atrocities, its violence. But, um, you know, I want to say, please find the time to recharge. All of you are in this room, in the Zoom room, and maybe following this on Facebook, because you have been directly or indirectly affected by what's been happening in Burma. And we just got to remember that in such tough situations, having little moments of happiness and sharing and recharging your heart is really important to be able to keep going and have that energy for next year. And also those little moments of nuggets of happiness or satisfaction or contentment is actually sometimes the strongest form of resistance that we can offer, um, uh, that, that, that we can express when we see when we see so much death and disaster and brutality happening around us. This is why if you were to go to a refugee camp um, anywhere um, on any of Burma's borders or even the IDP camps, 
um, in the country, uh, you will uh, people often remark, especially foreigners, going, "Why are the kids smiling and laughing?" Well, they found a way to resist, and I think we also need to do so. So, as a special reward for all ten people who are in the Zoom room, um, I'm inviting you to my virtual Christmas Day uh, party. And I will send the connection or the registration details in the chat. So um, it's basically a Christmas Day online open house. And I'm a Malaysian. And I think uh, uh, Leah, from her experience in Indonesia, also might have the same experience that when we have festivals, sometimes those who are celebrating may declare an open house for a half day or whole day of the festival so that anybody was welcome to drop by and have some food and drink and good cheer. So um, hope to see you. I'll, I'll let you know how to register later. OK, um, that's all. I've run out of time to rant and rave. And um, hand, I'm handing back over to you, Leah. OK, but uh, Debbie, the best of going to an open house is the food and the drinks. Well, but if you come online, we know that you are a great cook, so you should invite us to really come and eat in your Okay, house. okay. Then, then si since you're in Bangkok, I'll send you the address, but um, we'll just I'll just uh, show what I'm cooking uh, for people who turn up, and you're just going to have to come next time when, when COVID, when there are not, no, none of these okay. COVID restrictions. Okay. Okay, now we go back. So this was a moment of resilience, like Debbie said. So we have quite a lot of uh, questions. So I will immediately do a first round and then pick up the other one in a second round. So the first question is, uh, how has the UNCT, United Nations country team, been the last two weeks? What can you tell us about the last two weeks? Then uh, the recommendation from people within Myanmar is not to use tough madao. So what can we use as substitution uh, for that? Okay. Um, uh, One more. Yes. I, I much is the U.S. position, uh, what we have seen now becoming a stronger position uh, for the abuses in Myanmar, how much has this to do with a desire to control the region and move it away from China? Um, okay, all those are tough questions. I am not really uh, going to talk about the UN country team um, because I actually haven't been looking in that direction. But um, I just have to say that the fact that over 200 um, organizations felt compelled to make a joint statement urging the UN agencies not to lend legitimacy to an illegal junta that's already been labeled a terrorist organization by um, the, the Special Advisory Council of Myanmar led by former UN Special Rapporteur Yang He Lee and former UN fact-finding mission members Marzuki Darusman, who incidentally is a former Attorney General of Indonesia and um, former Human Rights Com Australian Human Rights Commissioner Chris Sadoti. And, you know, these are not um, radical um, activists like myself. They actually are like considered people and they do like, you know, they, they went and did the legal analysis before they actually labeled the, um, the illegal military junta, a terrorist organization. So UN agencies, what the hell are you doing associating with a terrorist organization? There are actually um, protocols and mechanisms for UN agencies to operate, humanitarian agencies to operate in situations of armed conflict and also guidelines on how they um, handle combatant organizations and they should not be recognizing an illegal junta as the authorities in control of the country because these are not authorities in control of the country they have no legal um, legitimacy and they have no control over the country 
uh, if at the very least the UN agencies need to negotiate and need to consult the national unity government, which actually represents 76% of elected members of parliament. So that's um, something that we uh, need to understand. Now, uh, talking about um, geopolitics, the, the US versus China um, um, dynamic, uh, the reality is we can talk about what's happening in Burma and the dynamic in Burma in that context, and, but it's very hard to ignore what's happening to people on the ground. And looking at folks who are in the room, there's quite a lot of you who actually lived in Burma and have very good friends in Burma and may have, and like me, may have even lost friends to the brutality of this legal junta. Now, if we wanna talk about that, yes, we can. Um, I don't think this is, I'm, I'm not really the person you need to talk about. I'm not really the person who would talk about geopolitics um, as, uh, as an intellectual issue. For me, China is also suffering from what's happening in the country in Burma. And, um, and, and if we start um, looking at this purely as a US versus China situation, we're ignoring the particular, particularly harmful contribution of Russia. And we're also ignoring the fact that US dropped the ball on Southeast Asia during the Trump years. And so the Biden administration has to make up for it, has a lot of work to make up for it, and they have to do it while actually addressing what's going on in Burma. So we've had and, and, uh, Derek Shirley come out twice to Southeast Asia, and uh, Blinken was supposed to come out, Secretary State of State Blinken was supposed to come out, and this is supposed to be reflective of um, a heightened priority for Southeast Asia and Burma by the Biden administration. But we are hoping to see that um, there have been some frameworks in place, including the legislative amendment. There's been proposed new legislation in the US, happening in the US. The US made a commitment of $50 million for humanitarian um, aid to the country for people affected by the regime. And they've been actually trying to push to ensure that this aid can flow uh, through Burma's borders into areas that have traditionally need the, need the aid the most. Um, and that's all in progress. But, um, you know, China itself recognizes that they have a stake in ensuring their stability in Burma, and which is why China was the first one to do um, COVID vaccinations in Kachin and Shan states. They did cross-border aid even before anyone started to look at the policies and the mechanisms to do so, because it's purely for self-preservation. And this is why it's inconceivable why Thailand is still resisting cross-border aid, systematic cross-border aid. It's in Thailand's interest that there is a COVID-free buffer um, along the Thai Burmese border, um, and that um, and that um, the military does not launch air air strikes on civilians so close to Thai territory. Um, and let's not forget the Thai economy has been so hard hit by COVID. But um, you know when we're talking about aid, we're not just talking about fifty million dollars of U.S. aid. We're talking potentially about um, what, what the Burmese organizations are calling for, the repurposing of 820 million US dollars for cross-border humanitarian aid. And you cannot deny the impact, the positive impact they can have economically on the Thai border areas, which has already been hard hit by COVID, if you have um, up almost up to $820 million crossing into your region to go into Burma over the space of a, a couple of years, you definitely are going to have local economic benefit. So anyone who cares about um, economic development or economic recovery in Thailand's border areas, we're talking about Tak province, Chiang Mai province, um, down south to Sankla Buri, Kanchanaburi. If you really want to have um, 
um, economic recovery and you care about that, then you definitely would want to have the border open for humanitarian, cross-border humanitarian aid. So that's basically, I hope I answered the, the question. I also wanted to share um, our response to Hun Sen. Just hang on a sec. Uh, hang on. Yes. That's our response to Hun Sen. We, um, um, our comms, uh, have, can you see this uh, meme? Um, um, Altian comms, uh, Altian comms uh, folks um, tweeted yesterday and the day before yesterday. It's a, it's a redepiction of Toy Story, and um, and um, and there's a famous song. You got a friend in me, and we have Hansen singing this to Min Aung Lai. Uh, basically saying we're going to have, uh, there's no, there, you know, we, we'll still have a talk. We'll, we'll go over to Burma. Uh, he was going to go over to Myanmar, go visit Myanmar and go like stay at home, Hun Sen. So that was a, a, a hashtag that a lot of people were using. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, um, of course, Hun Sen, who has been so severely criticized um, for, the lack of rule of law and his um, uh, vicious attacks on dissent and the opposition um, would love to hang out in Min Aung Lang, you know, because Min Aung Lang, by, by, by default, Min Aung Lang makes, makes Hun Sen look good. So who doesn't want to look good? Um, so, you know, instead of improving your own performance, you can feel comfortable being as bad as ever when you have friends like men online to hang out with. So that was that's our response to uh, uh, Hun Sing's olive branch to the war criminal men online. Does that answer your question? So that was the question about the UNHCP, but now about the Takma Dao, what is uh, another word for that for not using as well, yeah, that's a question. I mean, for many of us, Tatmadaw just meant um, the army. But actually, uh, um, in uh, political history, and it was very uh, strongly reminded to us early, early this week, uh, that Tatmadaw implies state forces, the state army. And the state army, and who is the state, is actually has been in contention since the 1st of February. So um, we recently, in the past couple of days, we've made an editorial commitment that we will refer, avoid calling it the Tatmado. For Burmese, this means the National Army, because these guys are no longer the National Army. And we will refer to them as Junta Forces. Okay, so this is very clear. So yeah. let's go to the second round. Uh, I think uh, someone is thanking you for your straightforward comments, much appreciated. And uh, would it be possible for you to inform us whether any foreign countries are contributing weapons to the anti-coup struggle or must the local defense forces, the people defense forces purchase their weapons at market price? There was also a related uh, question about uh, this issue, how can people support the PDFs with weapons? So a lot of interest in where are coming these weapons from. This is- Okay. We still not finished. <laughs> what do you think of Indian and Australia? I think Australia, you said it already, but Indian, uh, maybe you can elaborate a lot more as it seems that they are also sending some representative to Myanmar and their engagement with military dog Sitiao. This is the, I think the word, I don't know if I mispronounce it, but there was- Yeah, it, it, it's an insult to dogs. It's an insult to dogs. I like dogs. I wouldn't call those guys dogs. They are war criminals. Okay, so war criminals, we keep it, and junta forces. And the last uh, question calls, there are calls for a no-fly zone. Is there a chance uh, for this? There was also a comment related, but it's more of a comment related to the refugee flows 
uh, there are, according to this person who has been in my SOC, uh, there have been more than 4,000. Uh, and according to people there, the Thai military has been helpful in uh, channeling AIDS in Burma through my SOC. I have heard also different story of them continuing to send people back uh, to uh, back to Myanmar uh, on the border. So probably it's a mix, a parcel, but what is your view on this? Okay, if you are asking me about the price of kitchen equipment and cooking equipment and how we can purchase that, that's fine, I'll do that. But I do not call myself a weapons expert and let's not forget ASEAN, the organization I started, actually has a commitment to nonviolence. So while we support the right of people to defend themselves, especially when ASEAN or the UN Security Council and any other bodies are still not offering pr uh, effective protection, so the only way they can get protection is to defend themselves. So we, we respect that, right? Um, but we're not going to actually talk about, here's how you can send weapons to the PDF. The only PDF we deal with is the portable document format. And that's the official line from Oxian. I'm not going to talk about how to support them. You can actually go on Twitter and, um, and Facebook. And there are a number of people who are actually announcing ways and means to gather up funds for that. Um, the PDF, the People's Defense Force, is supposed to be aligned to the National Unity Government. And the National Unity Government actually came out very early in its formation to issue guidelines on how the PDF should be complying with international humanitarian law. So um, if you are going to, if you want to strengthen the NUG's influence and ability to compel PDF and other aligned militias to follow these guidelines, then if you opted to support the armed struggle, which I am not, and Oxian is not, um, then channel your money through the NUG so that if you do decide to support violent means, that these violent means are constrained by NUG guidelines on compliance with international humanitarian law. So I've done the responsible adult thing. Now, um, no fly zone. Yeah, Wait, this is- Because there was another part to the question, which was more so far, if they purchase it through foreign countries or they had to pay for, so that is more an information about- I, 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 I know that, um, uh, you know, traditionally, even um, during the previous armed struggles with uh, ethnic armed organizations, um, basically uh, they obtained their weapons from a variety of sources, including captured weapons from the former Tatmadaw, now known as Junta forces. So, um, you know, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not a purveyor of weapons, so I haven't had a clue about the markup and, um, and all of that. You know, you should ask uh, folks who are authorities in small arms, um, and there's a number of organizations and a number of people I can put you onto, but I'm not going to publicly out them. Okay, no fly zone. Nope. Yes, it's a good idea. And if the Security Council actually cared about security, they would be talking about this as the next step instead of a piss week poorly worded uh, resolution, which was the minimum that they could do to keep everyone happy. Um, it's very clear that local calls for no-fly zone have been increasing because this is how the uh, military has, the, well, the junta forces have been attacking civilians by launching air and drone strikes. And, and uh, so in addition to artillery bombing, which is more conventional, we, we saw so many airstrikes launched. Remember, we put out uh, a fact sheet uh, in May showing that within two weeks of the ASEAN consensus, 
the five point consensus um they the 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 junta forces launched i think in excess of 50 airstrikes 50 bombings of uh, in yeah, 50 bombings all around along karen and kachin state so, you know, and then we've seen those attacks also in the West, in Chin State and Sagain. So, you know, it the call for no-fly zone is completely justified. And, um, and there's also been calls to ban the sale of aviation fuel, which is used by the Junta's uh, Air Force to attack, to launch air attacks hel hel by helicopters, uh, uh, helicopters or, or fighter jets and drones on local communities. So I think if we were serious about pushing the UN Security Council to do something, at the very least, they should be talking about no-fly zone over Burmese airspace, India. And is there a chance was the question. Is there a chance? Okay. Um, I remember, you know, this is like grandma, you know, since we do work on Burma since um, in the eight, late eighties, you know, you you have a little bit of uh, uh, a, a little bit of uh, ability to recall certain things. I remember back in the year 2000, uh, 2002, people were saying we really need to escalate the international attention on Burma by putting it on the agenda of the UN Security Council. And everyone was saying, oh, no, there's no way you can get Burma on the Security Council agenda. So people actually put their heads together and they actually analyzed the different reasons that countries have been put on Security Council um, um, agenda. And then came out with a report which showed like Haiti, you know, UN Security Council got involved in Haiti over overturn of democratic elections and this um, drugs, uh, you know, uh, civil war, you know, inter-ethnic, da, 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 all these lists. And then Burma, check, 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 check. That report was called Threat to the Peace. It was jointly uh, published by the late Václav Havel, whose 10th year anniversary of his passing was just a couple of days ago. Um, we owe Václav Havel from the Czech Republic a great deal in the Burma movement. And he was he jointly published Threat to the Peace with uh, Nobel laureate um, Archbishop Dem Desmond Tutu. Um, and within a matter of months, uh, Security Council officially started talking about Burma. So, you know, Burma is uh, one of the countries in which what is impossible yesterday is possible today, and what is impossible today is possible tomorrow. Uh, simply uh, because people were determined, were, were innovative, and um, had enough energy and um, lateral thinking to actually make something happen. So I, I, I wouldn't say it's impossible. Um, um, I, I would say it could happen. It's just about overcoming some of the complications. When, whenever we did advocacy, I remember in 2012, when the first wave of anti-Rohingya violence happened, um, the, okay, so I'm, I'm sharing some trade secrets here. So um, keep it to yourself. Um, um, when the first wave of anti-Rohingya violence um, happened in 2012, we went to New York with our Rohingya sisters um, and other ethnic uh, women activists to talk to um, people who were drafting the UN General Assembly Third Committee Resolution on Myanmar to say, you need to include reference to the atrocities against Rohingya. Now, the EU was the pen holder of that resolution and they said, we are very sympathetic, but it is impossible for us to change the text um, because there's all these positive things, other things that have happened and uh, you know, we, can't, uh, we, we have to be balanced. And uh, you know, most of the text has already been negotiated and uh, you know, we can't, it's impossible to change it. So I walked out of that meeting smiling and uh, uh, my Rohingya sister who was with me said, why, do you, why are you smiling? She said it was impossible. And I say, it's, 
it's impossible because she did not imagine someone's going to make, make her change the text. And we did because um, the text that was eventually, the resolution that was eventually adopted did have text uh, language on the atrocities against Rohingya in 2012. And the atrocities against Rohingya ended up becoming a semi-permanent part of all UN resolutions since 2012. So um, I, I never like to say, if, if you tell me something is impossible, you make me so happy because you didn't imagine that some of us are going to try to make that happen. Now, India, what can I say about India? Um, you know, it's it, 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 in the good old days when George Fernandez was, was defense minister and we had a more progressive government, more secular government in India, there was a lot of space for Burmese dissidents and, and exiles to operate. Um, and, um, and, and that was the generation that also recalled that Aung San Suu Kyi grew up and was educated in India and went to school with some of the country's leaders. So there was this, uh, for this, this warm feeling of solidarity. And, and now we see a situation where um, under Modi's administration leadership, we have a very nationalistic, self-interested uh, administration that is um, more concerned about their own benefit, more short, they're more concerned about their own short-term benefit than um, the long-term security and stability of the region. So, you know, India is always looking out for its own interest and um, it's always having this competition in trying to offset China's influence in Burma. And that is their main, um, the main motivation of the current administration. It's not, India will never win out against, will, will, will find it extremely difficult to offset or win out against China when it comes to Burma. So they should actually really think about where they stand in the long term, because when this coup is reversed, the democratic government and the democratic movement in will will actually hold uh, Burma's neighbors accountable for what they did and what they failed to do during this horrible period in the country's history. Um, by the way, I see some um, names in the room, including people who actually stayed at our office 20 years ago and I haven't been in touch with for a long time. So really, really happy to see you here. Okay, last, uh, before we say goodbye, uh, because there is an interesting uh, question. What has been the reaction to uh, the progressive voice called by international finance uh, organization institution like World Bank, IMF. So not so much the UN in general, but more the banks. Uh, what, is, what are the banks doing? Okay, so um, I also was involved in February in helping IFI Watch Myanmar to draft a letter that was signed by over 200 organizations to freeze all loans and disbursements, all loans and grant disbursements to the mil illegal military junta. And um, indeed, uh, we estimate that about $11 billion worth of disbursements were frozen. $11 billion worth of disbursements, the equivalent of 13% of Myanmar's GDP in 2020. So it's quite a lot of money. Now, um, uh, uh, when the letter was sent, the, uh, the second, the follow-up letter was sent in October, um, the IFIs quickly responded, very quickly say, we're not having anything to do with Myanmar. Um, but actually, we're trying to reschedule, trying to schedule another engagement, another dialogue with them to say, no, actually, what we want you to do on Myanmar, Burma, is to take at least some of that money to repurpose it for cross-border assistance, because if you're serious about economic recovery 
uh, uh, to the COVID pandemic, then at least contribute to a local resilience, um, especially when they're facing this human humanitarian crisis, not just caused by the weaponization of the COVID pandemic by this illegal junta, but also um, war crimes and atrocity crimes. Um, and the junta's uh, uh, um, destruction of economic infrastructure and its interference in the economic infrastructure of the country that's caused so much pain and suffering. So I think um, uh, that's what we're going to be busy doing in the beginning of next year, waiting for, uh, we'll have to wait for all the IFI folks to come back from Christmas holidays and New Year holidays, and then um, um, start engaging them again. The reality is that um, most Thai people still do not understand how much of an economic benefit and how much of a human security benefit this will bring to Thailand. And they need to understand that it's not just about helping people in Burma, it's also in Thailand's interest to allow cross-border aid to, uh, to start, to resume, because we had cross-border, a systematic cross-border aid program um, uh, until about 10 years ago. Okay, so I think we had a very comprehensive update uh, as usual uh, with a little bit of humor just to recharge ourselves in between uh, the other news which are less humorous. And I think there is a lot of uh, thoughts about what can be done and the importance to believe in the impossible. I think this is what... Uh, there be messages that there is nothing impossible. It depends on us to realize it. But of course, it may take uh, some time. But we need to see the opportunities and pursue those opportunities. So thank you very much, uh, Debbie, for this uh, positive uh, message to all of us, especially relevant at the end of the years where we all feel a little bit tired and insecure about what the future uh, will bring us. And I will be seeing you at your open house. I don't want to be set for nothing. I want to test your cooking finally. So I will be there. <laughs> but for all the other, I am sorry you will have uh, to miss it. So best wishes uh, to all of you. Most of the one today have been uh, very loyal in following us. And I think this is, we are uh, very happy to have this group of the share our concern for Myanmar. As an information, the exhibition on uh, women on the street for a new Burma will be brought to the FCCT in uh, January. They have asked us to, to put it there. So from the 15th of January to 10th of February, uh, will be there and there will be a fundraising event for the FCCT uh, fund for journalists in Myanmar on the 24th of January as well as uh, a panel on the first about uh, what is, is the title I think is checking uh, on resilience one year on so the stress is on the resilience for Myanmar, what next? So there will be a panel also at FCCT on the 1st. At C Junction at BACC, we are going to have another exhibition uh, with Three Fingers organization, but we cannot call Three Fingers because Thailand, <laughs> it refers to Myanmar, but in Thailand is of course also <laughs> sensitive. Uh, so we will name it in another way, but it's basically about artworks uh, by Burmese uh, artists that have uh, expressed their view of the history from the beginning of the coup up to now. So the history of Myanmar uh, seen through artwork and that will be from, sorry, 18th of January to the end of the month. So a very full start of the new year with new energy from this year. So once more, Thanks a lot, and oh. we will see. <laughs> we will see 
Uh, they'll be again on the 5th of January for the sex and unfortunately last episode unless we convince her to remain for some more okay oh, no, i might run out, i might run out interesting things to say so be kind to yourself be kind to others and uh so that we can uh keep up the energy on burma so please recharge and take care of yourself see you next time in a couple of weeks bye okay, bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, bye bye nice to see the face Jennifer, Lisa, and all that. Yeah, team. Jennifer's the one who stayed at my office like more than 20 years ago. Oh my gosh. Five, five Hi. years. We have Lisa, who, we miss you for a while, but glad to know you are back. And Anthony, also an old friend that Hi. supported Hello. us. With the Kennedy Foundation of Thailand. Uh, we are very happy with the partnership since the very start of C junction. So a very good friend and some so, other who don't show their face. So Bye. yeah, so so uh, join our online thing. It's in the chat box how to register and I'll see hope to see you if you're free. Okay. Foul yeah. language is allowed in my parties, not in Leah. <laughs> <laughs> Bye bye. Bye.